So for week three, I was, I was praying and asking the Lord for direction on this specific weekend. It's really important the foundation we're building upon. Do y'all agree with that? Like this building is only as strong, like we see the ceiling, we see the walls, all of that's amazing, but this building is only as strong as the foundation it's been built upon. So I don't wanna get to June, July, August, September and say, man, I wish we'd have started off more spiritual. I wish we would have dove in a little bit deeper. I wish we would have prayed a little bit more as a family. And so when I was praying about week number three, the Lord took me to something that was a subject that honestly kind of goes against the grain a little bit. It, it, it's like brushing a wet cap backwards. It's like, so you're like, what? Don't try it. It's, they get feisty. It's like trying to swim upstream when the current is coming at you. I want to talk about this word right here, which in our modern culture, we have our own opinion. I want to talk about the word rest. Some of you, I already heard some people like, oh, oh rest. Because modern day culture says rise and grind. Modern day culture says no days off. Modern day culture, the way I was raised was rest means you're lazy. The way I was raised, if you take a day off or you don't work hard, then, you know, my grandpa would always say, no, no, I'll rest when I'm six feet under the ground. I'm like, that's super dark. Like that is very, ooh, I don't like that. So I want to talk about some areas of our lives that we can find a cadence and our rhythm in the word, and we can prioritize some areas of our lives, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, to find rest in the Lord. Here's our anchor verse, Psalms 46, 10 on the screen. It says, be still. Somebody say, be still. It's right here, be still, and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Say it one more time, be still. Taking down notes for week number three, my sermon is titled, Leave the Rest Up to Him. Leave the rest up to Him. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you. We need it. There's so many things contending for our attention. We need to hear your voice today. God, give us a mind ready to understand. And most importantly, we need a heart ready to receive all that you have for us today. If you're ready, say amen. I feel like a lot of times we're pretty good. Statistically, we try to find our rhythm to be still. How many of y'all would say, I do a pretty good job? Like, I've got my, I've got my routine. I, I feel, how many? Nobody? Okay, eight of you. It's going to be a great message then. It's going to help you. <laughs> no, but I see sometimes in our humanity, like, some people like to go for walks. They like to, I like to take drives with no music on no noise on, my, my phone's always ringing, I'm always dealing with something. We're, so I like sometimes to just roll down my windows, and not right now, it's, it's brisk. <laughs> this weather's got me wearing a jacket, looks like my grandma made it out of a quilt. Some of y'all were like, Is, do they make that in men's? <laughs> Anyways, I, I, it's cold, but I like to roll down my windows, and I, I love coffee, coffee's my favorite color. And if coffee's wrong, I don't wanna be right. You know what I mean? Like, I love coffee. So there's moments in our humanity where we say, yeah, I, I think I could, I think I could say I, I, I've learned to be still. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a walk on the beach. Just don't step on the, the needles that are in Galveston's sand. Just be careful. And maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a, a cruise that you've, uh, maybe are, you're planning. Maybe you've got something planned this summer and you've got some moments. How many of y'all have some moments this year planned to be still? Like you've got some moments to just rest a little bit. Okay, great. A lot of times though, when we try to be still in our own strength, statistically, we end up coming up empty because we can, again, create moments in our humanity of stillness and rest and serenity, but what ends up happening is we end up coming up empty and that, that stillness we try to create in our own strength runs dry and we still end up frustrated. We still end up overwhelmed. We still end up tired. We still end up internally anxious and if you're in the medical field, you can uh, DM me if I get this wrong, but I was reading in the medical journal about adrenal glands and how they release a hormone called cortisol and what impairs, when you're stressed, this, they, 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 it impairs your capacity to actually think right and make healthy decisions. Now, now, if you will just sit and take a moment, as I was reading this, they said if you'll just sit quietly, the cortisol will subside and things will become more clear. How many guys ever in a stressful situation tried to make a decision and you felt like, man, I just cannot get my mind right? The medical world is saying, hey, this is a, a hormone that's released called 
cortisol. I remember uh, I, I was at the dentist this years ago. I was at the dentist and the, the lady came out and said, I need to check your blood pressure. And I was like super calm. And, and she was like, whoa, your blood pressure is super high. And I was like, what are you talking about? Has that ever happened to anybody at the dentist? Like out of four of you. Yeah. Anyways, you and I were in a little club and they were like, sir, you need to go to the hospital right now. I was like, I feel fine. I'm just freaked out about this, this, <laughs> this root canal I'm about to get. And they were like, no, no, you need to go. So I, I go to the ER and I'm sitting there waiting. And literally the lady's like, I was like, I went to, because my mouth was numb. She's like, Dennis. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, you're like the fourth person. She's like, this happens all the time. She's like, people panic in the dentist. I'm like, I feel fine. It's doing the root canal. Anyways, I'm sitting there. The doctor comes in, hands me an apple and says, what do you like to watch on your phone? I was like, basketball, ESPN, like, Highlights, she's like, do that, I'll be back in 30 minutes. Within about 45 minutes of just sitting quietly and being still, I actually never turned on anything. I just ate that super crunchy apple. I don't know. It's like, I, my mouth is numb. I'm trying to bite into this apple. Anyways, there's a lot of details, but I'm sitting there, and within a few moments, I was calm. My blood pressure registered normal, and she's like, you can, you can go home. But when we're stressed out, we begin... To, there's a lid that's put on our lives and we don't experience clarity. That's why it's so important to continue to read the rest of the verse where the Lord says, be still and know that you're in charge. It doesn't say that. It says to be still and know that I am God. Be still in Latin means to vacate. Literally vacating a place. Another one I read, a definition said to take a vacation. Some of y'all are like, that was worth me coming this weekend. Amen, right there. To be still is to be on vacation, amen. <laughs> no, but a lot of times when I try to do it in my own strength, what ends up happening, maybe subconsciously, unless you're a control freak and you're trying to do it in your own strength, which is okay, it's not okay, but we're gonna pray for you, amen. <laughs> what ends up happening is you almost try to be the voice of God or the God of your own life, lowercase g, instead of allowing the God, the one and almighty God, the creator of the universe, but also cares about the intricacies of your life, we're up here trying to figure it out in our own strength. And he's like, hey, do you, would you like me to be God now? And would you like me to breathe on this? You need to be still and know that I am God. Because when we do this, we recognize that he is still in control. When we recognize that we're, our posture is to be still and know that he is God, we also recognize that he is watching over us. We're still knowing that he's big enough and strong enough to handle anything and everything that we're dealing with in life. It always blows me away. I probably go to this almost every week. It still blows my mind that he's big enough to put limits on where the sea stops. Yeah, he's small enough to see a tear hit the pillow that you've cried. He's small enough to know the intricacies of your life. Oh, thank you. Can somebody say, I'm grateful that I have a friend in Jesus. Come on, I need somebody to say it. Maybe that was just for me. The world has a way of compelling and attempting to try to get us to be still and rest that never will fill us up. It's literally like chasing after the wind. And then there's God's way. There's God's way where one moment in his presence, his spirit can enter a room and miracles can break out. Something happens when you're still and you know that God is fighting for you. Exodus 14, 14, one of our go-to, my wife and I's go-to says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. What does that mean? I don't need to do anything? No, no, no. It just means you need to rest in the promises of God because what happens is it empowers you with boldness and confidence to start proclaiming things like this. This anxiety, yeah, it isn't mine. This stress isn't mine. This depression isn't mine. This, this loneliness, no, 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 no. This isn't mine. This barely making it, this isn't mine. What's mine is I know that he is still good and I know that he is still God and I know that he hasn't overlooked me and he's still with me and he's still for me. So who cares who's against me? That's what's mine. What's mine is the peace of God. What's mine is knowing that I have a father and a friend in Jesus. What's mine is knowing that even though my money might be a little messy and all my finances aren't exactly where I'm believing for them yet, I know that my God is still my source, that my God is still my resource. And watch this, he will finish what he started in your life. He will finish what he started. 
I was born, some of y'all know this story, but I was born into a pretty messed up situation and I would have been deemed in the natural an accident. Like, multiple times trying to convince my mama to abort me. Some of you are like, what happened? I made it, like I'm here, like I, she, I'm here. But from the moment of conception, he is faithful to complete the work that he started in you. Close your eyes and say, you started something in me. Come on, I need you to just prophesy this over your life. I need you to believe it. God, you started something over and in my life. And I know that you're faithful to complete the work you started in me. No matter how, look at me real quick, no matter how fragile your life feels, no matter how super glued your life feels like it's been put back together, no matter how duct taped and stretched and, and like I feel like I'm on the verge of breaking, he is still there. He is still your very present help in time of need. He is still your mighty tower. He is still your refuge and your strength. He is still right there. When others have ran out on you and others have abandoned you and others have lied to you and lied about you, he is still consistent. Come on, give God praise if you're grateful that he is still good, that he is still watching over you, that he still provides peace that overshadows you in the midst of chaos, that he is still fighting for you in battles that you don't even know about. Oh, that he knows your yesterday, he's got your now, and he's already in your future. That's, that's a good God. That's a good God. And here's the thing about our humanity. We have to rest, depend on, completely rely on him. Because I've been saying this for a while, but repetition is key. God will never give you a life where he's not necessary. So if you're trying to do it in your own strength, I'm telling you, at some point, you will hit rock bottom. At some point, you will hit a lid like, I just can't do this on my own. Correct. Because you're not that good. On your own. Look at the person next to you and say, that wasn't for me, that was for you. Come on, let <laughs> Just feel like I should say that. <laughs> All right, the Bible talks quite a bit about rest. David actually talked about this a lot in the Psalms and did it to music and did it to stringed instruments. God created rest for our benefit to restore, to rejuvenate, and to recharge us. Rest in the Lord is a frequently used expression in the Bible. David said it this way in Psalms 37, seven. Rest in the Lord. And this, we love that opening line. And wait patiently for him. Some of you are like, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up. Because that's part of the fruit of the spirit that maybe you don't have down yet. Majority of us don't, especially in Houston traffic. <laughs> Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. What's interesting in this text, the specific Psalms, David wasn't referring specifically to physical rest, like taking a break from an activity, relaxing, napping, gathering strength. He was, for context purposes, he was talking about resting in the Lord in a spiritual context, resting in the Lord from confusion, resting in the Lord from, from worry and, and stress. The Hebrew word translated as rest means to be at peace, to be still, to be quiet and calm, Here's for all my Bible friends who are like students of the Bible. You would consider yourselves like Bible nerds. Watch this. In place of rest in the Lord, some Bible translations say this, be still before the Lord. You can find that in the ESV and the NIV. Be silent before the Lord. That's in the CSB. Surrender yourself to the Lord. That's in the Good News translation. And be still in the presence of the Lord. That's in the New Living. Why do you, why do you care about all this? Because these different translations convey the idea that we, our posture, is to receive the rest and the peace provided by God. And here's our part. We have to consistently stay intentional about being present in the presence of the Lord. The thing that's blessed me so much during this Monday through Friday prayer time where hundreds of people have come through is watching people disconnect from the things that are contending for their attention. And there are people that, that, there's bold prayers. And by the way, never judge a person's passion until you know their past. So when somebody's walking like, I pray God that the wows will fall down, like amen. But then there are people literally laying down, I'm like, hey, you have to check their pulse. I'm not sure, I'm not sure they're breathing. I love watching people and how their different expressions of their gratitude has been displayed throughout this past 
two weeks of prayer, but this is the thing I've noticed. If I had one sticky statement takeaway is I'm watching people being present in the presence of God. Because you can be in the presence. Have you ever been in the presence of someone, but they're not present? They're like, oh, yeah, I love that about that. <laughs> Double like. <laughs> Hold on, I'm FaceTiming somebody. <laughs> Just give me. Brecken, don't look at me. My son's like, that's you. Take it easy, okay? <laughs> to be present in the presence of God is to disconnect from all the things contending for your attention. To just be still and know that he is God. We can experience true rest when we spend time in his presence and we're present in his presence, praying and reflecting on his word, disconnecting from our busy schedules as we're still and silent and present. And then we allow him, because this is a choice, to work in us and through us, which is why we talk a lot about open-handed. Because God can't fix, heal, restore what you refuse to release. And he can't fix, heal, or restore who you pretend to be. That's a word for somebody. Somebody's going to have to take off them lashes and say, okay, God. <laughs> what is that? I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. That was not necessary. It was not necessary. <laughs> oh, this is the last service. I'm just... God's like, oh, there she is. I didn't recognize her. <laughs> Guys, stop it. What are we doing? Okay. I love it. We love it. My wife is beautiful. She puts all of it on. I think it's amazing. Let's bring it back. Faith and rest. Gentlemen, I'll come for you in a little bit. Okay. Faith and rest both work together. Faith and rest both work together. Some of you are waiting to take that step of obedience. And you're like, PD, I get it. But until I fully understand the details, I, I I can't rest. You don't understand. Like, I feel consumed by this. I was talking to a, some friends of ours yesterday at our prayer time, and I went over, and they're in the middle of a pretty, she's in the middle of a pretty massive decision, and we were talking, and I said, hey, look at me. You don't need all the details. We say this all the time, that God will give you direction, but not all the details. Come on, how many of y'all have ever been in that spot? God's like, I want you to do this. You're like, let's go. And then you're like, okay, now what? And it's like crickets, but he just wants you to trust him. So I said, listen, you don't need the details and you don't even need to have the full plan. You know why? She said, why? I said, because you have his promise. You don't always have to have the full plan. Now, we love Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. But the key part is, it's his promise. It's his promise in the plan. And we may not have all the plans, but we have his promise, and his promise is yes and amen. And his promises, they don't break when you lean on him, and his promises, thank God, don't have expiration dates on them. If God gave you a word, he is faithful to complete it. Yeah. Now, there's some obedience that we have to lean in and sink our hearts up, because obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. So he may be saying, hey, I want to trust you with more, but you refuse to give. I want to trust you with more, but you refuse to serve. All right, now I'm going to step on somebody's toes. Some of you have been holding your gifts really tightly, and you have refused to jump in and serve. Oof, this is for somebody. I have not said this in any of the other services. Some of you have allowed some offense. They don't see my gifting. Here's the confusion. You think your gifting belongs to you. But that gifting is from God to you and through you. And so this is a church where purpose comes alive. So quit holding on to your gifts like they belong to you. Man, they need me up there singing. Not until you get your attitude right. Not until you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I'm coming for people today. I don't know what it is. It might be this jacket. I'm hot. I'm very warm up here. It's very cozy. Is it heated? What is the matter with this thing? Ooh, you don't have to have all the plans. I feel like that was a word from somebody. You, for somebody, you don't have to have all the plans because God, I'm resting in your promise. I'm resting in your promise. I'm resting in Proverbs 16, 9, that in my heart, I've got some plans, but it's you, God, that will establish my steps. That's the promise. That's the promise. 
that he will not leave you or forsake you. You're going to go through some patches of rough waters and seasons of frustration, and we're going to go through some stuff in 2024, but this is our faith. This is the prophetic prayer that we're praying that we're going to get to the end of this year and look back and say, God showed up here. He fought for us here. He provided here. He delivered there. He healed over here. Come on, make some noise if this is going to be your greatest year ever. This is where faith kicks in. This is where faith kicks in. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is resting in the Lord and obeying until I understand. I will trust you even though I can't fully track you. I will trust you because I'm trusting that you are my built-in GPS, Holy Spirit, and I will take every step of faith trusting that you are putting a light on my my path. And here's the absolute truth. We have to understand this. If you want to learn how to rest, I need you to catch this. God is not, God is not in a hurry. We are. Like we, we run fast. Like Pastor Jack and I, we've ran fast our entire marriage. Our kids run fast. We run fast. Some of you are like, I could beat you in a race. You're not catching it. You don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I only run if I'm being chased. Like I'm not, I'm not challenging anybody to race. No, we run fast. God is not in a hurry. We are. And this is where we end up getting tired and stressed out and anxious and disappointed. I would rather be right in the middle of God's will than behind his will or in front of his will. That's why we say a lot when God speaks to you, Paul's pray and be patient. Because if you don't, you'll end up trying to figure out, oh God, I want to be in your will. And God's like, I need you to just... Breathe, rest, be in my word, trust me, spend time in my presence. Because we can kick down doors or we can wait for God to open doors. And let me say this, I've said this multiple times for some of you because I know the drive, I know the grind. We've got some, we've got some business owners and startup companies and I mean, we got people that are doing some amazing next level things here. And here's the truth, don't, don't, don't wear yourself out doing a bunch of things that aren't your business. A lot of us are busy doing things that aren't our business, and we're literally just grabbing what I almost dropped the mic there. Or we're like grabbing wherever the wind is blowing instead of just saying, God, I want to hear your voice. Wake me up in the night. Speak to me. I don't want to just be busy doing a bunch of busy work. I want to do what you are saying. I believe God is trying to get our attention at the very beginning of 2024 to choose to rest in him. We have to choose to rest in him. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus' words says this, come to me. It's a choice. We're choosing. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I might give you some rest. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you rest here and there. Some of you are like, what's happening? It doesn't say that. Say it out loud. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. This line right here. And I will give you rest. 16 of you participated. I appreciate it. I will give you rest. This is right here. This is the promise. If we will choose to trust him, if we will draw near to him and we'll come to him in our weariness, in the things that are heavy, the promise is he'll give us rest. My prayer this weekend is that you would choose to surrender your timeline in favor of his peace and his rest. My son's in the room, my oldest son, he's a gamer. He's really gifted. I went to North Central University in Minneapolis and they have like a whole gaming program. They put a ton of money. These kids are like professional gaming athletes. Y'all have heard this before? Like full rides. They've got like a bus. They travel like a college football team. This dude walked in and they're like, easy. That's ninja number 8640. Like this guy, <laughs> college kid's like a legend on the campus. He's making like 2,000 a week. Like people are walking around. Like he's, he's got like the Wu-Tang Clan. It was like 14 deep just behind him. And he sits down. There's people like rubbing his shoulders. They got a fan on him. And he's like, blah, blah. He's playing. I'm like, this is unreal. Is this real life? Like this is incredible. So I'm like, son, time to step it up. Anyways. <laughs> then you'll tithe on it. Amen. Dexter, 2K a week. Okay. But he's good at gaming. Now see, when I grew up, like I was pretty gifted at like, are you can. NBA Jam, like, he's heating up. Like, y'all know what I'm talking about? 
What's so cool is Breck has been getting into some of those older 8-bit games. He's like, Dad, this is crazy. Like They're like, nah, nah, nah. And I'm like, we played NBA Jam the other day. It was phenomenal. Anyways, there's some games in life that are complex, and there's some we just understand. One being the game Red Light, Green Light. Like, we know that game. It's simple. You line up a bunch of, the kids all line up, and then the one kid He's like the alpha in the group. He's like, all right, here we go. Green light. The kids all start running. Red light. And they stop. And they're like, nope, Cody, you're out. Cody's like, I didn't even move. Like, you're out. (laughs) Red light, green light. True story. I've talked about my wedding reception woes where I've injured myself because I have a fever. And the only prescription is dancing. Amen. Like, that's the only thing. (laughs) Don't know nothing about that. And I'll do a wedding or something, Pastor. And that was not an invitation for you to ask me to do your wedding, by the way, because I get a lot of requests, but let's talk. Anyway, so Pastor Jackie's always like, babe, one song and we're out of here. Like, you can eat the fruit, but food, but we got to go. And then that song, like that song, a song will come on. I'm like, babe, this is our song. She's like, this is not our song. I'm like, let's go. That's our song. <laughs> you tell me the electric slide's not our song? Let's go. You tell me the chicken song is not our song? Let's get out there. Anyways. The DJ, we're about to leave, and he comes on. He's like, what's up, party people? Tonight, we're going to do something fun. We're going to do red light, green light, wedding reception edition. And she's like, we got to go. I was like, "Mm, I'm in. I'm all the way in. So they they start this song, and he's like, green light. Everybody's dancing. He's like, red light. He's like, "Mm -mm, girl right here with the ill-fitting dress. You're out. And so she's like, what? I bought this at Deb. Anyways. So we, he starts this song. I'm looking at her, and she's like, we got to go. we like, we got to go. And then he starts, jump around. Jump around. Jump, jump, jump up and get down. Jump, jump, jump. And y'all, I'm like, I mean, I'm wild out there. Like, we're just jumping. And then he's like, red light. And he stops. And y'all, I stopped, but my ankle went like this, and I broke my ankle. And she's like. She's like dragging me off. They start another song. I'm like, I got to go back. She's like, your, your ankle is literally broken. And now it's, this is not like a terminology like I rolled it, like I snapped my ankle. Jump around. She, nope. Red light, green light. Why are you telling us this? How is this relevant to the message? Sometimes I believe this is how we think the game of life goes. That God says, hey, I want you to go. And we're running. And he says, stop. And we, maybe we choose our own humanity. We don't stop when he says stop. And then maybe you were raised in a different culture. Maybe you were raised in a little bit more of a religious culture. And you think because you didn't stop that you're out of his will completely forever. And maybe you've been carrying around the shame and you've been carrying around condemnation. Maybe you show up here week in and week out and you feel like there's a, a lid on your worship. You're like, all these other people are praising and singing and shouting. They seem to have joy, but you don't know what I'm carrying. You don't understand the compartmentalized pain and you haven't been able to find rest. You haven't been able to really enter into the rest that we're talking about, the be still and know that he is God's sort of rest because you've been carrying around anxiety. You've been carrying around this this heaviness because religion will say this. This is why we say all the time that Hope City's not built on religion. It's built on relationship. Because religion will say, I messed up. My dad's gonna be so angry. Relationship says, I messed up. I need to call my dad. I want my kids to always know, no matter how far away or broken or what kind of decision you make, I want you to know you can call your dad. I want you to know that you can call me. But maybe you've been bound by this. Maybe this has been depleting you emotionally and frustrating you. Let me just commend anybody who showed up again. Anybody who came back to church We talked to somebody in between services and she said, I've been gone, I've been away from church for a long time, but I felt something stirring in me to just come back today. And I said, great job. She said, it was hard for me. I said, but you're here, you're standing, you made it. Like, look around, there's a community here that will love you. So I wanna just give a shout out to everybody who tried again, who came back to church again, who showed up again. Because here's the truth. We have all, every single one of us, this is why I'm so grateful for his grace, for every goof up, mercy for all the mistakes. And the goal is to just grow a little bit more every day. 
I've said this before. The good news is you're growing, but it's uncomfortable. The bad news is you're growing, but it's uncomfortable. The goal is to grow every day. Romans 3.23 says it this way, since all have sinned, as everybody, and continually fall short of the glory of God, absolutely none of us deserve the grace, the kindness, the goodness that Jesus paid the price for. That's why throughout this series and throughout our 21 days of prayer and fasting, if you're, if you're here today to only grab this one truth, I want you to hear this. Surrender is not a one-time event. It's a daily choice. Every day, I want to surrender a little bit more because we're all fallible. We're human. Every day, there's something a little bit more. The Bible says your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. God, let me be a little bit more willing every day to give you a little bit more. And open-handedly, I'm gonna trust you. Every day, my wife and I, we're growing every day. I wanna grow old with this girl. Like, she, she has phenomenal genetics. Like, she looks, we're, in July, we're celebrating 20 years of marriage. 20 years, it's phenomenal. She looks exactly like she did 20 years ago on our wedding day. I look like I'm aging like an American president. I don't know. I don't know. Now she, she like, if we're gonna watch a show, she walks in like this and she has all kinds of things on her face and she's like, you too can have this life. I'm like, mm-mm. Mm-mm. We'll just be 60 together and everybody will think you married me for my money, <laughs> which I still don't have any, so I've tricked you, amen. But we're gonna grow old together. So every day, I choose intentionally to grow a little bit more. She chooses every day intentionally to grow a little bit more. Our daily walk in relationship, we're not, we're not building everything based upon where we were yesterday, the day before, a year or two years ago. No, no, we're continuing to build from here. Surrender isn't a one-time choice. It's a daily choice. It's a daily choice. God knows that we're all prone to sin. Don't look around the room. Some of you are like, he's more than me. (laughs) God knows we're all prone to sin. It's us who try to convince everyone else that we're not. It's us that try to convince like that we have it all together. But something that robs us of our rest, I said this a moment ago, but there's condemnation, there's shame. There's a lot of things that maybe we've compartmentalized and you're like, yeah, but if, if they only knew, if people really only knew the things that, uh, if they, it, it, would, it, it would ruin, people would not love me if they knew the skeletons that are in my closet. I was talking to a friend and I said, man, everybody, I was just in passing, I was like, hey man, listen, everybody has skeletons in their closet. And he goes, what? And I said, Every, everybody has skeletons in their closet. He goes, skeletons in the closet? I said, yeah, everybody has skeletons in the closet. He's like, you mean it's like spiders in the closet? I said, Ske- skeletons in the closet. He's like, is that the best place to put skeletons is in a closet? I'm like, okay, you're freaking me out. Like, this is a, this is a saying. We'll just move on. I don't understand. I shifted and I said, we all have things we're not proud of that we try to keep hidden and even buried. But here's the truth. Because we've all fallen short and we have to live in a perpetual state of like God I need you to heal and restore, and here's my open-handed life. The problem is, if we bury the things we're afraid, if they only knew what I was wrestling with, we instead end up wrestling with anxiety instead. We instead end up wrestling with things like hidden pain and compartmentalized pain, and the truth is, God can't heal what you refuse to reveal. God can't heal what you're wrestling with and you're fighting with, because if you don't release it and give it to God, And the truth is, you'll stay in a perpetual figure eight cycle of brokenness your whole life. You really want to enter into a place of rest like Jesus did? You got to give it all to God. You have to live in a place where you say, God, here's my past. Here's stuff I'm wrestling with currently. Here's things I try to fix in my own strength. But I'm going to trust you in the middle of it and trust that you know better. That's why I said it a moment ago, but today is the leader sign up for our HC groups. Maybe you've been through freedom before and God's been stirring in you to lead a freedom group or co-lead a freedom group. And then next Sunday at our ninth anniversary, we're gonna be doing uh, connect group sign up. So our HC groups, you can sign up. And the one I wanna just really, really empower and challenge people to step into is our freedom groups because it peels back the layers and you can reveal areas of your life that needs healed. You can clean out the skeletons and the spiders in the closet and let go of some things. Wave at me if you've been through our freedom group before. Come on, make some noise. 
How many of y'all, you experience real freedom? It's incredible. There's things that you've been holding on to, and you're like, I thought I, I thought I overcame that when I was 13, but I've still got unforgiveness and bitterness issues and brokenhearted issues and frustration. I needed to forgive that person, and I needed to let that go, and I needed to reveal that so I could heal. I want to encourage you, sign up, step in, because anything that robs you of your rest is too expensive. Anything that's robbing you of your peace, peace is costing you way too much. That's why it's so important to cast all of your cares. He's, he's the God who, who is big enough. He is the one true God who is strong enough to handle all the stuff that you're dealing with. And don't let the enemy try to convince you you're the only one dealing with stuff. Because he, he's, he's pretty good at it. He's the deceiver. Here's what the Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares, not a few of them, but everything, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Every concern, all of your struggles, all of your anxieties, all that stuff that you've been trying to hold on to, gotta give it all to him once and for all. It says once and for all. I shared this story years ago. Brecken was little, but you're in the room, so I'm gonna tell it. Brecken was little, and he came to me. He was really stressed about something, like, like really stressed. I was like, buddy, you okay? He's like, dad, I'm just kind of stressed about this. And he's telling me it, and I'm like, oh, I got it. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I got that. I'll take care of it. And he's like, huh? And I said, I got it. And some of you are like, what was it? It wasn't a house payment, I'll tell you that much. Like, it wasn't that, <laughs> it wasn't that stressful to me in my adulting life. But to him, it was pretty heavy. And I said, look at me, look at me. I got it. He goes, you give me your word? I said, got you. We did like a little handshake. I was like, see ya. He was like, cool, all right? I said, cool, go. And I felt pretty good. I was like, I gave my word. I am his father. Like, it was cool. It's a cool moment. An hour later, Finley walks in. She's kind of like, kind of like him hawing around a little bit. She's like, hey, dad, what's up? What? And I got like a little thing with her and a little twirl and like dipper and I was like, a little handshake. And she's like, hey, do you remember Brecken? I was like, what do you mean do I remember Brecken? He's your brother. He's the oldest kid in the family. And she was, oh, sorry. Do you remember when Brecken asked you if you could take care of? And I'm like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, he came to me and said, dad said he was going to take care of it. Can you go check and see if he has? And I said, Brecken! You said a spy in the camp? Like, what are you talking about? And I was honestly frustrated because I'm like, I gave my word. So I was like, Brecken, get in here. Finley came in. I was like, what's this? What's going on? He's like, well, I just, I, I came to you and you said you were going to take care of it. I was like, it's been 53 minutes ago. You got to give me a minute. But I said I would follow through and I gave you my, and I'm, I'm honestly getting frustrated. I don't even know why I was getting so frustrated. And I felt like the Lord said, he checked me. The Lord checked me and said, don't yell at him. You do this to me all the time. And I was like, not me, maybe Jackie. Not me. <laughs> nope. Every time we place something in the hands of God, whether it's a situation like diagnosis or something that's a little bit, maybe what feels like more insignificant but big to you, every time we place something heavy or even what feels like it's just light and why would I even give this to the Lord? Because he says to cast all of your cares. We're not designed in our humanity to carry it. The human psyche does not need to try to process all of that stress all the time and constantly have all that conflict. Cast all your cares. How much? All. And then this is my challenge for you in 2024. Stop monitoring what you placed in his hands. Quit going back like Brecken did. No offense, Breck, I love you. You've outgrown it, okay? You've, you've outgrown it, my guy. But he was worried I wasn't gonna follow through on my word. So many times we're like, God, you've created everything. You told the seas where the limits would be, not for the water here and all that stuff, all the stuff I've been talking about today. And you, you've seen my tears. You've seen all the st stuff I'm stressed out about. And you've done all of this. In Genesis 1, and 28, you shaped and molded me in my mama's womb and you're faithful to complete the work. But I'm not sure if I fully trust that you're gonna come through. So my challenge for you is stop monitoring what you've already placed in the hands of God. And I'm telling you, you will enter into rest. Somebody say amen. Because I have faith that God not only protects and holds me today, but I also am grateful that he's already protecting and in my future. Luke 12, 25 says, and besides, what's the use of worrying? 
What good does it do? Will it add a single day to your life? And then this line right here says, of course not. So we're gonna shift for a moment and I wanna talk about, as we're bringing this in for a landing, how rest is not weakness, but rest is actually stewardship. And I've learned that rest is a power move. It's a pace, that pace is proof of maturity. Because again, I was raised that rest is laziness. That like, if you're resting, you're lazy. I said that a moment ago. Some of y'all are like, I haven't worked in seven years. I don't even care. That's maybe a little lazy. We'll pray for you. Amen. <laughs> we'll pray for you. It's okay. We'll talk about that. No, but rest is not weakness. Rest actually produces longevity in our lives. And this is funny, but Daniel slept in a lion's den. Peter slept in a prison. Jesus took a power nap in a storm, no matter your circumstance, you can take a nap. Come on, how many of y'all like to take a nap? How many of y'all are into naps? Big naps. Now, for me, power naps are a waste of time. Like, people are like, just give me a second. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I'm napping right now. I'm like, you're talking to me. They're like, I'm asleep. 15 minute super nap. 30 minute power nap just makes me want to fight. Like, I don't like it. A two hour, two and a half hour nap, like that's sleep. You might as well just sleep all night long. Like, why even? That's called sleep. I like, a, <laughs> I like a good nap. Rest actually produces and is a necessary component to restoration. Watch this. Rested people react with clarity because there's more in their spiritual, social, and emotional tanks. Rest is in the Ten Commandments. For those of you who are students of the Bible, commandment number four is remember the Sabbath, which is all about rest. On the seventh day, God rested. Our staff, we have built in a day off. It's a day of Sabbath, and we encourage our staff, don't fill it up with a bunch of busyness. Take a moment to rest. I have a father in the faith that taught Jackie and I early on. He said, listen, even God rested on the seventh day. You can't trust him. You got to work every single day. He said, learn how to figure out how to take a break, because when you give God that one day of rest, He'll bless you with six days of supernatural strength. So I'm gonna challenge you. Some of y'all are like, I work every day. I'm an eight days a week worker. Listen, it's okay. Figure out how to take a breath. Figure out how to rest this year. Medically, for those of you who are in the medical field, medically, the quality of your rest determines the pace of your healing. Rest is triune because you are triune, your spirit, soul, and body. Rest is not merely Netflix or sleeping in. How many of y'all are like sleepers? Like you could sleep, sleep in. Like you could like, 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 nine, like nine hours, 10 hours. Oh my Lord, 12 hours? What kind of schedule are you on? <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I'm good on like six hours, but this 12 hours, I don't even know what I would do. Wow, that's phenomenal. My wife, she can sleep. Like, she loves to sleep. My kids love to sleep. Anyways, real rest is a calculated targeting of restoring your spirit, your emotions, and your physical body to be rested physically but spent emotionally will cause an imbalance and ultimately lead to brokenness. It messes with your joy. It messes with your strength. It'll mess with your peace. Another one of my fathers in the faith says, listen, filter everything through this word halt. Don't make any major life decisions if you're hurt, angry, lonely, or tired. Be aware of where you're at with clarity. Be aware of how you're hearing the voice of God because energy is a currency. What are you spending it on? What are you spending it on? How are you stewarding your time, the time that you've been given? We talk about this all the time with our kids that the days are long, but the years are short. My little boy right here at Brecken, he was little. Now he's grown up and has Keith Urban hair. He's big now. But we're not into killing time. We want to make the most of every moment. We don't want to just fill everything up with busy work. I love this Zig Ziglar quote. It's on the screens. If you don't plan your time, someone else will help you waste it. Oof, that was worth the trip this weekend. If you don't plan your time, someone else will help you waste it. I'm praying this weekend, and as I've been praying this weekend about the author of rest, I found that Jesus himself understood the importance of rest. We're bringing this in for a landing. Mark chapter one, verse 35 says, very early in the morning, some of y'all are like, that right there is why Jesus and I are different. <laughs> what about in the afternoon? <laughs> Amen. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. 
He left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The noise of the modern world makes it where we're almost unable to hear the voice of God. It drowns out the true input of what we need. That's where true rest, being again present in the presence of God, unlocks the ability and fine tunes in our ability to hear the still small voice of God. But if we want to really experience rest, here's the key. As we reset the beginning of this year, you have to learn to put boundaries, limitations. You gotta put a fence around toxic voices that you've allowed in, the things that you've believed that other people have said about you. I was so inspired. A couple days ago, Brecken and I went to HEB and we ran into a lady who's a part of our church and, and I said, she asked me what I was fasting. I said, I can't, biblically, I shouldn't tell you. You know what I mean? I didn't say that. So I told her, I said, what are you, what are you fasting? She said, Pastor Daniel, I'm cutting off all news misinformation, social media. And she's like, I feel so free. I have so much more joy. I don't care what anybody's saying, what they're saying about me. I don't have to worry about what I want to say to them. Come on, somebody. She said, I got to put realistic boundaries and limitations. Start by limiting those voices in your life because what ends up happening is it robs you of your ability, once again, to be present with God to be present for other people, present in all that's good and beautiful and true in the world, and even present for ourselves, because if we're not careful, we'll end up with a pessimistic slant. It's like, well, Houston's hot in the summer, weird weather in the winter, it's all concrete, it's all just fast-paced life. We were driving the other day, and my wife said, hey, put your phone down for a minute, and I always use that. Baby, I'm working on my sermon, but I wasn't. We were just driving... She said, put your phone down and look at the trees. Just look around. It was beautiful. But when we are not present and we're allowing all the other distractions and we haven't put, we haven't put boundaries and limitations in place, we're just surviving the day instead of thriving in the purpose that God has for us. You don't have to be, you don't have to be consumed about the quantity of time in the presence of God. It's about the quality of time. Are you being intentional? Are you being intentional at the beginning of this year? Come on, we're gonna finish strong, y'all, this, this fast and this prayer time. Are you being intentional about spending time in the presence of God? I have a friend who writes books named Bob Goff. And a couple times a year, I get some moments where I get to go out to this retreat center that he has, and he talks to other writers, and he's talking about writing books. And at some point, uh, Pastor Jack, he's got a phenomenal book that's gonna drop. It's gonna be amazing. I'm prophetically speaking that. You need to get that thing written, girl. Anyways, we've got some things in the works. It's gonna be amazing. But here's the key. If I wanna know information about the author uh, you can go to a Barnes and Noble book signing. You can stand in line and be like, hey, I love the book. What inspired you to write about the mountains? <laughs> can you sign my book and sign one for my mom? Like, some of you are like, what is he talking about? If I want to know about rest, I want to go to the author of rest. Yeah. And the author of rest is Jesus. There's three types of rest that Jesus engaged in. I'm going to go through them really, really quickly. Number one, write this down. It'll be on the screens. Three types of rest that Jesus engaged in. Number one, Jesus prioritized spiritual rest. This 21 days of prayer and fasting is so key to rest in the Lord. We're prioritizing our spiritual walks with the Lord. Luke 6, 12 says, in those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. They spent the night in prayer to God. Jesus walked out spiritual rest through prioritized time with the Father. If Jesus did this, we can do this. Come on, somebody. If Jesus did this, as Christians, to be Christ-like, this is the pattern of the author of rest. Luke 5, 16 says, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness to pray in seclusion. Jesus knew there was no better way to prepare for his day than to spend intentional time with the Father. I'm gonna invite you one more time, starting tomorrow, Monday through Friday, 9.30 to 10.30, to come and join us at our offices to have some intentional time of prayer. Hopecity.com slash 21 days. That's the last, it's my last push for that. All right, number two, write this one down. Jesus prioritized emotional rest. Emotional rest. Jesus walked in emotional rest, and he prior, prioritized this by processing difficult moments with the Father. We in our humanity go to social media. We in our humanity blow up everybody else's phones like, I don't even need to get into it, but I need you to pray for me. If you're going to four or five people talking about the same thing, you may not want to break through. You may want attention. 
Jesus prioritized emotional rest. He got in the presence of his father. And, and, and let me show you this. At the, after the loss of Jesus, his cousin, John the Baptist, he decided, because he was both fully God and fully man, he decided to withdraw for a moment. Matthew 4, 14, 13 says this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place to process emotional rest and prioritize his time with his father. So many of us find ourselves doing the opposite. I've said this a couple times throughout this message, but we walk through a difficult moment and we end up self-medicating with busyness. I said this last service, but my mom would, my mom would say like, honey, just keep yourself busy. How many of y'all have ever been like that? If I can just keep myself busy, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. I went through that terrible breakup, that terrible situation, but I'm just gonna keep myself busy. I went through that situation, and instead of facing it head on, I'm just gonna keep myself busy. But the truth is, Jesus prioritized how to emotionally rest than we can as well, because it's not just about filling your life up with lots of numbing and avoiding life moments of busyness. When you're emotionally and mentally spent, the best time to draw near and cling to the heart of God is that moment. Because again, real clarity comes when you find rest in him, Deuteronomy 4.29. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, the last one, the third type of rest Jesus engaged in, number three, Jesus prioritized physical rest. Jesus engaged in physical rest for the sake of continuing the work that God had called him to Mark chapter four, verse 35 through 41 paints the story. It says that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. He had been preaching. He was tired, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37, a furious squall. That sounds like a hard rock band. Like, what's going on? What's up, Houston? We're furious squall. Anyways, sorry, that was just for me. This massive storm comes up. It was way funnier in my head than it comes out. Okay, <laughs> can y'all see it though? It's like a little like, what's going on? Okay, anyways, Jesus was in the stern. The storm is sweeping through. Their boat is nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. He was prioritizing physical rest. And again, if Jesus did this, then we should be able to do this. If Jesus took a moment to take a breather and a break, you should be able to take a breather and a break. Watch this though. This got really like super dishonorable. The disciples woke up and said to Jesus, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then all of a sudden the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41 says they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Here's the truth. The wind is rarely at your back making life easier. It's usually in your face making you stronger. Now, if you only came for this moment right here, I need you to hear this. The disciples were in the middle of the boat, in the middle of the storm. They had just seen Jesus preach to the multitudes they saw miracle after miracle. They saw breakthrough after breakthrough. How many of y'all have seen miracles in your life? Come on, you've seen breakthrough in your life? Some of y'all like, I haven't. You're breathing, that's a miracle. You got up again today, that's a miracle. You survived, I said it earlier, 100% of your worst days, that's a miracle. But they saw all these things, yet as soon as the storm hit, they forgot who was in the boat with them. And so many times, that's what happens with us. You're sitting in that room and the doctor says, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to walk this out. And we forget who's in the boat with us. When that job, that layoff happens, we forget who's in the, in the boat with us. When the economy gets wild and inflation's out of control and you don't know how to pay for everything, that's when we realize he's in the boat with us. The disciples got really familiar I think that spirit of familiarity got real and they were like, teacher, are you just gonna let us drown? You're just gonna sleep the day away? But what they didn't realize was the answer was in the boat. 
The answer for everything you need is in the boat with you, in the middle of the storm, on the mountaintop, he's with you. In the valley, he's with you. In the presence of your enemies, he's, he's with you. Come on, somebody say it out loud. He's with me. And we can find that true rest, knowing at the end of it all, he's with us. The Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus 33, 14. He says, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Just stand to your feet and just lift your hands open-handed and close your eyes for just a moment. God, today I pray that we ourselves, like Jesus did, would prioritize spiritual rest, emotional rest, and physical rest. That we would cling to your heart, we would get in your word, we would recognize that hope has a name and it's Jesus. And if we cling to you, O oh Lord, everything that we are believing for, the clarity, the wisdom, the peace, the discernment, the fight, the joy, everything we need is found in your presence. So forgive us, God, for being so consumed by life that we haven't been present in your presence. But God, today I thank you for an extra overshadowing of your strength that has a boldness come over us that says hell can't break a person who gets their strength from God. And God, I pray that we rest in that promise today. Not all the details, not all the plans, but knowing your promise is yes and amen. Would you do this with your hands lifted open-handed, which is, uh, uh, it's kind of a dual posture. It's a posture that says, I release anything that's in my life that's not of you because I want you to become greater and greater as I become less. I want you to increase as I decrease, but it's also a posture that's open-handed to receive whatever he wants to give and deposit and bless and pour out on you. Would you just begin to just let go of and forget about and disconnect from everything around you and anything around you and all the noise that's been around you? And can we just rest in the promises of God? Can we just cling to his his heart for a moment. God, I thank you today for peace. I pray, God, today for a stillness to fill every campus, a stillness to meet every person watching on YouTube or Facebook or hopecity.com slash live. God, I pray right now that you would just fill our hearts. Fill, God, the areas that have had voids. Fill, God, the areas that we have been filling with other things, God. Areas that we've been self-medicating and that's been robbing us of our peace, that's been robbing us of our rest. God, I pray and prophesy for sweet sleep tonight. Those that get awakened in the night and their heart is racing and their mind begins to race, I pray, God, that they'll sleep all the way through the night. I pray, God, that they have a peace and an understanding that you've got their back, that you've got their now, and that you've got their now. Next. God, I pray that you would begin to breathe and move. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come and rest. Come rest on us. Spirit was moving. Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. I'm telling you, if you would just cling to the heart of God today, you'll experience that rest. Say, Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Spirit was moving. was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Rest on our families. Rest on us as individuals. Spirit was moving. Spirit come. Move over us. Rest on. Holy Spirit. Come on, every voice. Say. Holy Spirit. Come. Rest on. Oh. 
hands. Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest. Come rest on. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because after all of these years, you're still good. You're so good. I feel peace filling the house. After all of these years, you're still good. You're so good. Come on, as a daughter, as a son, say, after all of these, you're still good. You're still good. You're so good. After all of these years. Everybody grab that from generation safe. From generation to generation, there's no boundaries to your greatness. No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, just not done yet. From generation to generation, there's no boundaries to your greatness. No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, he's not done. From generation to generation to generation, there's no boundaries to greatness. No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, just not done yet. From generation to generation, there's no boundaries to your greatness. No eyes have seen, no ears have heard. After all of these years, you're sick. I feel breakthrough in the room. After, after all. I need you to receive that peace one more time to say, after all these years, you're still good. Yes, Lord. You're so good. One more time, sing it from a daughter to a dad, a father to a son. Come on, if he's been faithful, if he's been good, will you give him praise? Come on, after all these years. Oh, God, let us experience that rest, that peace today. With every eye closed just for a moment. We didn't flow like this in the other services. There's something special. There's something special in this room. If you're here today, and I'm gonna give you two invitations, the reason we do all of this is for this moment right here. And you would say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I, I haven't experienced rest, and I'm not experiencing that peace you've been talking about because what you said and I heard and it pricked my heart was that the author of rest is Jesus. And I don't know him, but I want to. I wanna know him as my personal Lord and Savior. Here's the key, it costs you no money. 
If you've ever watched a late night televangelist who said, you gotta give money for this, this has all been paid in full. The tab is covered because of the price that Jesus paid on that cross. He shed his blood to cover all of your sins, all your struggles, things that you've revealed, things you're hiding. He also covers all your iniquities, all your sickness, all diseases. He is the God who sent his best gift, his son Jesus, to hang on the cross because he said you were valuable. So he said you were worth it. That's the first invitation. Pastor Daniel, I wanna know Jesus for the very first time. And here's what we're gonna do as a church family. We're gonna pray. And according to Romans 10, verses nine and 10, we're gonna confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. And it says that you will be saved. He's gonna write victory in your story. Erase your sins. Throw your sins as far from the east as the west, never to throw them in your face again. Now others might, because you, you can say it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That's the first invitation. The second invitation, you could say, Pastor Daniel, the reason I have had no rest, spiritually, emotionally, or even physically, is because I've been running. I've been restless because I've been living reckless. Today I wanna come back. Religion says, you said it in your message, religion says, I messed up, my dad's gonna be so angry at me. Relationship says, I messed up, I need to call my dad. Come back, come back to the arms of God. He's just one mention of his name away from healing, restoring, and delivering. With every eye closed, and when I count to three, I want you to boldly say, I'm the first invitation. I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. I'm the second invitation. I want to rededicate my life. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. If you're watching the replay, it's not by chance or accident. The Holy Spirit is getting your attention. If you're in this room and you feel something convincing you of the fact that there's more to life than the way you've been living it. You wanna get things right with Jesus. One, for the very first time. Two, you wanna rededicate your life. Three, I want you to lift up your hand. I'm looking all over the room. I see you and you and you and you. I see you and you and you and you and you and all four of you and in the back. I see you, my friend. I see you in the middle. And I see you here and here, here, here and here and here and here and here and here and there and there and there and there and there. More hands than I can count. Come on, Hope City. Can we give it up for everybody that just said you're talking about me? Amazing. So this is what we're gonna do. From Hope City worship to everybody in the room, those joining online and everybody who lifted up their hand, will you say this out loud? Say this prayer according to the word in Romans 10, verse nine and 10. We're about to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Watch, he's writing victory and everything is about to change. Say this out loud, Jesus, it's me. Here's all this sin, here's all this shame, here's all my condemnation, here's all my brokenness, here's all my bad choices. I give them to you and I ask for your forgiveness. I repent for all of my sins. Thank you for being faithful to forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, thank you for hanging on that cross, exchanging your life for mine so that I can live a life of freedom. I can live a life filled with hope. From this moment on, I'm choosing to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Can we just make some? Now, come on, let's give God a huge praise. Heaven's rejoicing.